Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to the ADA to the McShane Reading Plan. We are glad you could join us in the Word of God today. We are in Exodus 40, John 19, Proverbs 16, and Philippians 3. Philippians 3 is a powerhouse chapter from, from Paul. We'll probably revisit it in a future time, but Paul counts all of his tradition, heritage, personal taste, anything dung and loss before the Lord. Whatever you hold of value, it's not that you shouldn't hold it of value, but comparatively speaking, there is no comparison between the value of Christ and the most precious thing you hold, including your own family. Yes, that's what the stock of Israel meant to him. Family, loyalty, patriotism, um, it's a big deal. Our first loyalty is to Christ. And even then, we press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's an ongoing thing. Um, the struggle is not about attaining salvation. It's about those who have already trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation in his blood, his death, his burial, resurrection. It's about the struggle that we endure in this life representing him in our private lives in our home lives in our family lives in our social lives in our public lives sanctification drawing closer to him we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god so like a race sometimes you run into holes and fall and dip and into ditches and by the way and you grow weary and fall and stumble yeah, but you keep going. You keep going. That's a blessed hope that we have. We press toward that mark. The mark is there. The calling of Christ Jesus is sure. It's not like it's being taken away from us, but we want to press toward being more like him. When we trust in him, when we are saved, when we are born again. Um, Proverbs 16 Proverbs 16, I want to make sure I got it right. Yeah, Proverbs 16, huge. Look at this, verse 4. And I, there's so many nuggets here, but this. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Wow. Does this mean that God is making people wicked? No. No, remember, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What does it say? He hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Look at verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy, truth, and truth, iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord, man depart from evil. Ah, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So, let's go backwards here. Again, we're pressing toward the mark. This is not about an earning salvation here, but when we are pleasing to the Lord as Christians in our walk, what does it say? It makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That means you're being a witness. People are going to emulate you. And if they don't, that's why in Christian societies, in Christian neighborhoods, in Christ, when there is a, an abundance of people who are following the Lord, that can be transformative. Yeah, that, that's, and certainly that's where Satan attacks and tries to get people in to disrupt and be a bad apple in the barrel, so to speak. Yes, but folks, when people revive and as a group of individuals follow Christ, the, the effect is enormous. Look at this. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. You don't purge iniquity by attacking iniquity. Now, that sounds counterproductive. Um, obviously, we need to take a stand against um, evil, against evil in, in our midst, in our own life, and against evil as it is being instated in a governmental fashion. Certainly, we should stand against evil. But more than standing against evil, we need to stand for good. That's going to be more important. Standing for good, for godliness in, in your life. That's 
important because we as Christians, when we become hypocritical in the eyes of the world, yeah, the world's going to want to criticize you anyway, but if you really are hypocritical, if we're doing, practicing things that we ought not be practicing, if we're engaging in behaviors we should not be engaging in, and especially habitually, it can be a real problem. It can be a very problem. Not only is it a hindrance to you individually, dear friend, dear Christian, dear brother, dear sister, it is going to be a hindrance to somebody who is outside the household of faith, who looks at you and says, well, wait a minute here, what's going on? But how are we going to purge evil and iniquity? By mercy and truth. Be willing to show mercy and truth. Mm, truth in love. Don't pull the punch, but land it lovingly. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. This makes it sound like men can choose to fear the Lord, right? I think that's how it reads. Otherwise, why would we have it there? If it's just simply God forcing people to fear him, then the opposite would be true. Because if he withhold his, himself from causing people to fear him, he would be causing them to not fear him. So the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. It is a choice that he has enabled us to make by the power of his son, by the power of his will. He has called us, choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua says, as a, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. So again, that makes it uh, the question be asked, um, can I choose to be proud in heart or can I choose to be humble in heart? Well, yeah, otherwise, why would God be addressing it? He's letting you know that everyone who's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. He doesn't cause them to be abominable to him. So why does it say he has created the wicked for the day of evil? Ladies and gentlemen, that means that he has created all things. He's created all people, including the wicked people. But he has not created their wickedness. He has created those that become wicked, those that true choose to be wicked. And there will be those, God knows, there will be those who have chosen wickedness, and they will be prepared for the day of evil. But even the day of evil, the great and terrible of the day of the Lord, is a last-ditch effort by the Lord, by his own choosing. Now, could he force them to do this or that? Yes, but he chooses to give them the option to plead with them even in the evil day. To use that evil to say, warning, warning, hey, don't do this. That's the gospel message even in the book of Revelation when all the woes are going on. And the, and the trumpets and vials and bowls and I guess the seals first. The trumpets and uh, the, the seals and the trumpets and the vials or the bowls. It's uh, the angel flies around saying, Whoa. Whoa, that's a good news. Yeah, it is. If it turns your heart to the Lord. If you're, you know, you have to be able to feel pain to be able to run away from something that's dangerous. In fact, if you don't feel pain, if you're numb, that's a real. That's, that's terrifying. If you cannot feel pain, if you cannot feel the sting of sin, you'll find yourself stumbling into it again and again and again. And that's, a, that's not a good place to be. That's what, it, what uh, is called in Romans chapter 1, being a reprobate mind, turning them over, um, seeking into the place where you're so numb that you are, um, God has given you over. And only God knows what that stage is for an individual, but don't get there. Don't go there. He wants you to love him. He wants you to humble yourself before him and enjoy everything that he has for you in this life and in the next. Um, John 19, Christ empties himself. Look at verse 11. It's so important. Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. You can't have any power over me, Pilate. The ones that 
brought you here, brought me here to you, even though I allowed them to do it. I allowed them to operate in the evil of their heart. They have the greater sin because they should know me and they are rejecting me. Pilate didn't want him to be killed. But Pilate still didn't have courage. I hope I really hope that Pilate later became a believer. But Jesus Christ, even among the sinful Jewish religious establishment of the time, Jesus Christ changed the hearts of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And friends, he transforms by his very presence. You realize that the cross was nothing more than an execution block. I mean, in all honesty, it, there, it's just by God's will and providence that we don't have a guillotine as our symbol, or we don't have a um, um, we don't have a gallows as our uh, as our symbol, or we don't have um, uh, take your pick at some method of execution. Uh, why is the cross our symbol? The cross is a method of execution. By his very presence, he has called it holy. Now, there's nothing magical about the cross. It's the one who hung upon it that is powerful. It's the redemption that he purchased by his blood that is powerful. It's his blood that is powerful. It's his death, his burial, and resurrection that are powerful. It's him that is preeminent, not the cross itself. But he has made the cross holy by having hung there and having died there. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, so when we look at passages like our selection from Exodus chapter 40, and they're calling all of these labors and tents and all this thing, God's saying these are holy. It's by God's decree that they are holy, just like God's presence hanging on that cross makes it holy. Gold within itself is not holy, but gold on the Ark of the Covenant brings death to one who touches it. Curtains and rods and, and uh, things that hold tents together and tent pegs don't make a tent holy or the elements holy, but God choosing to put his presence there say that you dare not enter the Holy of Holies unworthily without proper sacrifice and proper atonement being made and only once a year without dying. But wait the price that paid in the cross did away with that. The veil of the temple was rent in two, we're told. Remember? But what does it have to inform us of? As we're pressing toward the mark, we need to understand that it's not our works that save us. That we do have a choice, though, to follow Christ to let him transform us by the power that he has offered to us in his Son and as a dwelling Holy Spirit. We can choose in our lives to sanctify ourselves, to ask the Lord to sanctify us, to sanctify those things around us, to sanctify our job, to sanctify our family life, to sanctify our homes. Listen, we, we need not be religious about this or superstitious about this but it's you know praying around your home is not a bad thing asking the lord lord sanctify my home and prepare it for those who come within its walls as for me and my house we will serve the lord that's my family and my family has a dwelling lord bless my dwelling lord bless this house that you have given your congregation let us set it aside for your worship and for your work. Leave no stone undesecrated in your heart. Let the Lord guide you and let him make your life holy. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's not, it's not a talking about salvation. It's about growing closer to the Lord. And if there's some hidden secret... Um, chamber, some secret corner that you are holding back from the Lord, 
Maybe that is something that's holding you back from a closer walk with him that you've never even known. Maybe it's holding you back from understanding the scripture the way that you should. Maybe it's holding you back from hearing the word of the Lord in prayer and the Holy Spirit being attuned to him the way that you should. It's important that we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, that we make our moments and our atmospheres and our, our dwellings and our persons holy before him. Yes, we're going to mess up. There's forgiveness for that. We can redeem that. Just like we have to, that's, they had to wash things after they had sacrifices. We, um, we mess up. We bloody things up. We need to wash But if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, know that your salvation is sure. That you can go to Him for forgiveness on a daily basis. You can go to Him and say, fill me afresh, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done. Help me. Transform me. Walk with me. Not into seven times or seventy times, but into seventy times seven. And on and on. Not a ticket to sin, but a call. We're pressing toward the mark. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. And he's working on you. My prayer that you trust him today. We love you and he loves you. Have a good day.